Recording is on. <laughs> hey, Dominic. How are you? Hey, good, thanks. So you started Secure Scuttlebutt SSB a long time ago right now. How, how long has it been? Uh, well, um, it was 2014. So Whoa. <laughs> that's actually eight years ago. Um, and incidentally, that's when that's also the year that a bunch of uh, um, Hyper Swarm and Hyper and um, then known as DAT and IPFS and I think Gun also started then. Yep. 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 So that was that was like the yeah. Anyway, um, that yeah. Was the beginning of it all. So, I mean, what are you up to now? Um, well, I'm officially um, haven't been working on Secure Scuttlebutt for um, about 18 months now. Um, okay, that makes me really curious then what you've been cooking up. What's uh, well, mostly, mostly, mostly in that time I restored a boat. Um, actual science <laughs> no 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 i mean no Material science. no I, I i found a i found a sailboat on the parked on the side of the road and um it was like bushes growing over it and covered in moss and lichen and stuff like that and um well everything was just the right time and place that i bought it and um restored it and it had actually been sitting there for 20 years um but now it's back in the water and i'm on it right now so now the boat's launched um so the the famous photo of you on top of the mast taking a selfie down yeah so that was your old boat that's my and old boat how big was that one and then how does it compare what happened to it <laughs> oh um well it How still exists it for you to to, to um, refinish the new it's, one it's still um that that boat that boat um i still own that boat um if someone is in new zealand and wants to um buy a boat it's uh, technically it's for um well it's looking for a new a new owner um but i'm not really in a rush um uh then so that one was quite that one was considered quite small it was only 26 foot uh which is like 7.8 meters the new one is a uh quite different because it's a catamaran so it's longer it's it's nine and a half meters but it's also like four and a half meters wide so you have a huge deck area but then on the other hand, the in, in, internal space is like the cabin space inside of it is less. So there's um, two hulls and each have a cabin. So I actually have a guest room now. But the, the funny thing is like living on that other boat, I was like, it's actually great living in a small space because like you can, you know, you basically roll out of bed and then you can put the coffee on like you don't walk you know like these suckers who live on land like walking to a like, completely other room to like get out of bed and make a coffee like i just sleep inside the kitchen like it's so much simpler um well then and why the, is the switch over and also of months and days out of year how many are you on the boat versus that that you're living just totally off of the boat plus the whole wi-fi thing how, how do you get internet Oh, well, um, the, sorry, that was like three or four questions. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> too curious. The, uh, sorry, what was the first one again? The first one was, why did you switch over if you... Oh, yeah, yeah. Smaller oh, yeah, so, because so you no, 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 so, or, so the, uh, the uh, biggest uh, problem with the, the old boat was that it had a, it needed like a meter and a half of water to float in and if you had less water than that it would be like leaning over on like 45 degrees uh, which is not very comfortable um to have suddenly the small room you're in like just like way you know it's hard to do anything uh, when it's that leaned over um but on the catamaran it only needs 
about knee-deep water to float. Um, and if the tide goes out, it can just sit on the it can just sit on the beach or in the mud or whatever, completely level, um, no problem at all. So actually, right now, um, the tide's out. I'm in a really shallow harbour. When the, when the tide goes out, there's like big mud flats and stuff. I'm just sitting on the ground, um, which is the one of the big things I wanted um, because then, like now, like before, there are a lot of places I could go, but now there's like so many more places that I can poke into that I'm never going to run out of. Like even if even if I'd just stayed inside New Zealand for the rest of my life, I'd probably never run out of new places to go. Um, okay, well, so you're not even at docks. You're you're constantly in a cove that is near some sort of cell tower that gives you um uh wi like a, a Wi-Fi uplink. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, um, yeah. I mean, I'm just out in the like the like countryside right now, basically. Um, but you know, like it's just like I've got internet through um the cellular network. Uh, I've got like a a router with like an antenna. I haven't quite put that. The plan is to have the antenna be on top of the mast. But, um, you know, nowadays, like any place that like people live, you know, probably has cell phone coverage. Yeah. Um, so wait, can you do Starlink with a base station? Or does, I heard that Starlink needs some sort of grounds um, network system, but um, theoretically would Starlink work? Uh, no, Starlink wouldn't, doesn't work right um right now because it um well currently it's like locked to a particular um location like the satellite has to know where you are um so you ha they have like you ha can't change your address maybe you could do it a couple of times or something like that but you can't actually fix put salad on a movable um Okay, that's the, that's the next project for you to get into uh, SpaceX and say, "Hey, look, we got the GPS coordinates of the of the yeah. base station. We can just do dead reckoning and bring back in some of the sailor well, terminology well, and recalculate the, the um, receiving." I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure it's a it's a it's a feature that I've just um turned off. They're just not enabling it because it's in development or something like that. Um, but you know there's also other downsides like it um starlink draws a lot of power um whereas like the cell phone thing uses hardly anything and mm. this is like completely adequate for um um my purposes for now the you know the the difference is starlink would through if you could they let you move around it could it, it could work when you're out in the middle of the ocean um like far, far away from land, um, but um, currently just float. You know, I guess you know just. But I think I might bet I might like being able to just float around on the ocean and not be connected to the internet. Fair point. Oh, wait, but, so then internet you can get infrastructure for, but I guess that immediately goes into this power mode question. Well, okay. What about the bathroom? What about fresh water? What about um, electricity? Oh yeah, I mean, um, all that stuff is so. How how, how all that stuff is is pretty straightforward. Um, well, within like the the abilities of like a DIY hobbyist. So, um, for power, I have some solar panels. Um, with a catamaran, there's a huge amount of deck area um so there's a lot of space for solar panels um i have 600 watts of solar which i think is probably i think it's probably more than i need um but i think the right amount of solar panels is um if you think you probably have more than you need then that's probably enough um yeah the um I don't have a, a generator. I don't have like wind turbine or anything because well, they're both quite noisy, and I don't really, I really hate um, um, maintaining internal combustion engines and stuff. But solar panels are like totally quiet and really reliable. Um, for water, I just collect rainwater. Um, 
a lot of New Zealand, rural New Zealand is on, um, you know, that's how they get their water. Um, are you thirsty much? <laughs> how much, how many gallons are you able to collect per, um, to, I actually rewind really quickly. How many days of a year are you on are, uh, are you living on it? Um, well, uh, so over the last like six years when I was living on the other boat, um, so I got the boat first because after the, when I first, so when I was first working on Scuttlebutt, um, when I first started it, I was in a phase where I was like, just, I was speaking at conferences and getting all these free flights and I was just like traveling around the world um, and hanging out with other open source developers and hacking on stuff. And um, I was like traveling for like, um, like like nine months of the year, um, I come home to New Zealand for a little bit in the summer, um, and that got pretty exhausting after doing that for a couple of years. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll buy a boat, and then I'll be like settled down, and I'll just mostly be in, in I'll mostly be at home, and um, when I get bored of one place, I can just sail to another place. Um, so that was like felt like traveling, but was for me very settled down um and then i um was like uh to um like then I'd, I'd still take a trip like overseas like in the winter um conveniently most of the conferences are in the summer and but in the northern hemisphere and then i live in the southern hemisphere so i have like would just have like two summers um <laughs> one one in europe or the us and then uh in new zealand um but then there was a global pandemic and i was like this is a really good excuse not to leave this year so i've just been in new zealand for the last two years um but during that period where i wasn't um was living when i was living in the boat it was pretty much like nine months of the year um wow so then now back to, yeah, um, it seems like for electricity, what you have an electric uh, cooktop, which is pretty low powered, and then maybe gas based stove, and then everything else is really yeah. just lights and your computer, right? And uh, Yeah, I oh, know there's a gas, uh, gas, a gas cooker. He heating things up actually uses tons of energy. So yeah, a gas cooker is currently the, the pragmatic solution there. How often do you have to refill the gas and then into so the water is ring. Yeah, how are you? Do you so the, so the, there? the so I often describe it um, describe it as um, changing um, first world problems for third world problems. So now I don't have to worry about like the landlords raising the rent and like all these like because like first world problems are all these like things that like aren't really that bad but you don't have any control over it so it's frustrating but like third world problems are like do you have clean drinking water uh can you see what you're doing is there like are you warm is the weather killing you but the thing is with third world problems they're all actually readily solvable um by an individual if they have um access to a few resources um whereas like third world problems First world problems are like totally out of your uh, the systematic problems that are totally out of your control, um, no matter how much resources you have. I really love that framing, especially when we steer it towards algorithms. But I want to get a little bit last more details on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's these it's definitely relevant um, to both of those. Yeah. So um, the. Um, gallons of fresh water you're able to oh get. yeah um, and then hang on. so i think in it depends on the on the season um the it's pretty dry it's been pretty dry here in the summer um but i think in the average rainfall so one millimeter of rain falling on one square meter of collection surface gives you one liter so it depends on how much collection you have set up. But on the catamaran, it has such a large deck area um, that I have a, 
a 16 square meter tent set up and my calculations were I would be able to collect 600 liters of water a month um, based on average rainfall, which is way, way more than I can like normally use, um, how much water I'm actually using. So in my logbook, it says that I switched, a, refilled my the 20 liter jug, 20 liter jerry can that feeds the kitchen sink um, on the 18th. And it is now the 23rd. Wow. So I'm not being on, I've been on like four liters of water a day. Um, I think it's just about due to be changed. Um, wow. So that's like cooking and um, um, drinking. And I've been entirely on the boat the whole time. So, um, so I've got like six of those containers. So, um, that's like that's like a month of water. So you could swap it out at some sort of store when you go in for gas. So what winds up being the the biggest necessity for I assume waste management that you have to go back to some sort of dock or um or do something more government regulated. <laughs> um you might think so, but so the 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 standard way that most boats have this this like toilet thing that like pumps into a um a tank and it's got like water and shit mixed together in the tank and then um then that is either um so in new zealand the regulation is you just pump it, it get, yeah septic can go uh, into that into gets pumped fields. that actually gets pumped over the side but not inside the harbor you have to go out um not inside an enclosed area or in shallow water um however um those systems are like very uh not very reliable um like they're really complicated like I, on the last boat i removed i um removed the toilet um and it had like 20 hose clips and all these pipes and i replaced it with a bucket and then so you shit in the bucket and then you put sawdust on top of that and that sort of absorbs the um the absorbs any moisture and um this um and then it has a then i have like a funnel thing that separates the urine into a separate container um that can go just over the side that's fine um and then it takes like a 10 liter bucket takes like um like a like a month for one person to fill that with sawdust and toilet paper um and then that can be uh so then that's you this is, this is a composting toilet um i'm a huge advocate of composting toilets way simpler you spend way less plumbing um doesn't smell as bad as a festival port a port at a festival by a long shot um really um yeah you don't have to do any plumbing um the chances so of actually having to touch shit is much much less <laughs> so, so it's not septic at all um so does it mean you have to refill on soda i guess you're saying yeah that. okay i need to i need to make sure i don't run out of sawdust but i have uh in times um changed that for coffee for coffee grinds um oh uh dry slightly dried out coffee grinds actually works pretty well because i'm already addicted to coffee so that motivates me to go and get fresh coffee whereas like going to find some sawdust is like kind of more going out of my way something i need to plan ahead more um yeah, okay, then, so it seems like you know, coffee uh, takes you into <laughs> civilization sooner. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, no, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, yeah, food. I mean, food is probably the thing that I would go and um, replenish more often. But um, when the like pandemic started, I would. There was a. I mean, suddenly they like there was a snap lockdown. Um, and turns out I had um i did a stock take and i had 22 kilograms of dry food already on the boat of like beans and rice and pasta and things like that um so i was quite able to survive for um the next like seven weeks that it took um just by like catching a few fish and not having to go shopping at all um I did get down. I did run out of coffee and got down to the last tea bag. Um, oh no! Mutiny. But, 
<laughs> Mutiny. Yeah, I I didn't. I was like expecting I was going to have to go go through caffeine caffeine withdrawals, but I got when the time it was over and I got back to the city, I had one tea bag left. So I like, I'm, I I I it was, I made it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm laughing so hard over here and keep trying to keep my mic off so there's not a conflict okay um so I'm, I'm pretty satisfied on on all those questions if there's any other pieces of that that you want to discuss um, oh well i think the thing that's like a good transition into like what this podcast is actually about is that um living on a boat is great i think a great um um lifestyle for working on a peer peer to peer protocol because um you've re it reduces your uh expenses so low that you are able to like pursue um projects that um may or may not be financially viable or people think that you're kind of crazy for even um beginning whereas like you know um if i had like paid rent um while i was um working on scuttlebutt i'd be in the whole like um 50 grand uh just by just for that um whereas like um i'm i'm you know way ahead i definitely spend a lot a lot way less than that on boat maintenance nearly it's like a like a tenth of the amount that's super cool so i've noticed that projects that seem to win are the ones that realistically just survive <laughs> and being able to stretch your timeline out such that you can work on these types of crazy mad science stuff gives mm. enough yeah that's that's pretty neat so in the but the same way you were framing it relative earlier right about the importance of, of these subjects like that you know that's also just exciting uh, on its own so what what do you other than restoring the boats and stuff, what's what's kind of the future for you? Like, what are you, what are you looking towards? What are you excited about in software and peer-to-peer -peer systems? Um, well, the um, hardest. So I think looking back at Scuttlebutt, um, the thing that's like hard, was hardest about it was. Um, the um, well, so um, can we can we actually make it a different question? Yeah, about the future of the future of what projects? Um, I, I wasn't really asking. Well, I mean, I just I've I've I have a um I have a future project, but I'm not announcing it yet. Oh, dang it! Okay, that's fine. <laughs> you gotta yeah. so some secret future project, but yeah, don't want to. Um, so then um, let's go into the performance stuff that I was kind of originally curious to talk to you about on BIPIF and parcel yes. of the structures. I, I pronounce it BIPF. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's not a future thing because it's been around for a long time already. But oh, um, how is yeah. that? So, so um, BIPF, is, BIPF is in production now inside uh, Miniverse, which is the best um, uh, Scuttlebutt client. So um, re rewind a bit. So um, Scuttlebutt has its own database uh, design and its own like, database inside of it, um, its own implementation. Um, and the, when, and it sort of slowly evolved from like, because one of the things that, that led to creating Scuttlebutt was the level DB community inside Node.js, where it was just like we had um, someone had created level DB, level DB binding. So level DB is an embedded database that was created at Google. Um, it's a log structured merge tree. Um, that's ba so basically it has keys and values which are strings and it's sorted by the key um and it's stored in these structures called log structured merge trees that are sorted in the order of the key is it um, a radix tree also once it's merged sorry? is it a radix tree once it's no. merged? 
No, it's um, sorted. It so it 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 ends up if it's fully fully compacted, it would end up as a single file that's sorted in order of the keys. So you can do a binary search on top of it to find a particular any key. Okay, so the I'm kind of curious. Would you wind up using well? I, again, I don't know if this is going to leak whatever your the mad science stuff you will be working mm -hmm. on. Um, would you use BIPF in in that as well? Uh, well, um, let me let me let me um, go. Sure. Um, explain some of the, the history first. So, I started using level DB because that that was what had sort of brought me there, and then I realized like how do we actually build a thing on top of how do we actually build a peer-to-peer -peer app on top of this? And I was like, well, we need, um, one thing is like, we have this data of all this data that we've downloaded from the network. And then we have like views about that data, like other other um, views onto that data that tell us important, you know, that are like queries and that sort of stuff. Like as data comes in, we write, update the data that's about the queries. Um, indexes, for example, is one, a type of view um and then as more data comes in um you need to like update the views so you need to have a log that gives you the um all the data in the order that it's come in and then um you can so that, that then you can like if you crash if sorry if you're if you've received new data but you haven't built the views yet and you crash you can when you when you come back up you can see where you're up to and then update the rest and the um and this sort of was developing for a while a while but then the the scuttlebutt community grew and then there were the data set got much much bigger and then it started to take like longer and longer for to do this um view generation and then i sort of realized that well, actually, this like view, uh, this log based idea, it's like we're putting a log inside a thing that's meant to be like randomly sorted. Like you have a data, you have a log is already intrinsically sorted because you you only it's sorted by the chronological time of like adding a thing. Everything is always added to the end. So we're taking data set where the latest record is always greater than all the previous records. And then we're putting it to a thing that figures out where that's meant to go and then inserting it. I was like, this is silly. Like, actually, all that we need here is a file. We just need one single file and you always append it to the end. So then I refactored things and then made it so actually the data is just stored at a file. There's a log file and you just add to the end. Um, and so the database becomes just a log file interruption here um yep. you rewrote it to be files so it's no longer based on level or are you saying you refactored it in some other way like you built your own block store or just i refactored it's still on level yeah so um there was a transition where first it was a log on level and then it became a single file and then it became a file but it but it still used level for views so it used level for the things that level was was good for but then it just transitioned to just storing the record, um, the actual content in in a single file that was only appended to. And that single file, do you chunk it over time as it gets big? Or uh, no, because you can do this crazy lookup feature inside of it and just skip all the earlier bytes. Yes. Yeah, no, you don't you don't have to read the the with the log file. So the 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 index the primary key for a message in the log file is actually just the um, byte offset where that record starts. But at what point are you doing like checksums and hashes against the data? If you know if it's increasingly large, you're, re you're having to recheck some the whole thing. Well, uh, yeah, every every message has a um, has a signature and hashes and stuff on it. So that's checked before it goes into the database. In uh, terms of stored. 
Yeah. Yeah, but making sure that the file on disk doesn't come corrupt for any other reason. Well, because you're only appending to it, um, then it's that's pretty safe. I guess someone could go and uh, corrupt the file by um, changing bits at the start. Um, however, no one's ever complained about that before. Okay. Right. So n now that's not quite BIP yet. So let's yeah. take continue us on the, the well, story. Okay. So um, yeah. So then we have files stored into the append, append only log. Um, and then, so one thing that I'd always really wanted was, and why I started writing Scuttlebutt in JavaScript was the um, um, JavaScript's in the browser and I wanted it to work in the browser as well. But, and the browser has some storage access, but it's just way slower. It's like on top of IndexedDB and stuff like this. It's just not very good compared to what you have direct access to in the, um, on the desktop. Um, Index DB performance is miserable. Local storage is super fast, but you're yeah, but it's only five megabytes or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's not it's not very useful because at this point, Scuttlebutt is getting to like it's like hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes, um, and it's like ten times slower in the browser than it is on the desktop. So if I was having if we're having performance problems on the desktop, then they're going to be it's going to be completely unusable in the browser so we need to significantly improve the performance to make it viable inside the browser and i was like exploring looking at ways to do this oh, another thing is like we couldn't use libdb on the browser because it's compiled and has all the disk access and things like directly it's not going to work we have to completely implement a javascript database in javascript for it to um right but is viable isn't isn't local storage in several of the implementations actually backed by level? So inside, yes. So LevelDB is inside of um, Chrome, and then IndexedDB is implemented on top of LevelDB. But IndexedDB is like really terrible. I mean, of all the terrible, um, badly designed web APIs, um, IndexedDB is probably one of the worst. It's super, um, super bad. I could only get about 26 to 56 ops per second out of it, doing all the sort of ba batching and optimization. And level, uh, sorry, in, um, local storage will easily do like several thousand per second. And this is on yeah. like, like 2015 air. And then worse with IndexedDB, there's these obscure um, edge cases and errors. Thankfully, they seem to have gotten patched in the last year where on like Safari, um, it it'll it'll if you don't reset the database connection every I don't know fifteen seconds, IndexedDB itself will start generating random gigabytes of data to disk and mm -hmm. fill out your entire hard drive just as a Safari bug. And initially, I thought this was my fault, but it turned it's out a security out. bug. <laughs> it turned out to be, you, you. Wait, sorry, you actually know the, the no, no, no. or you're just guessing. Oh, sorry. I was just checking that I heard you right. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's a security bug. I. It. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't know the cause of it. I was just really happy to find out, because I, I, I assumed it was my fault. Because, like, of course, Apple and Google engineers know what they're doing, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> it wound up being Apple's fault because it didn't happen in other systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Index DB is miserable. So, but yeah. what's the point of using JavaScript if you are, um, you know, it, if you're outside of the browser, you have access to go and yeah everything else well, rust nowadays yeah i mean i was already a um a experienced javascript developer and thought it was a um a good language to prototype on um but yeah anyway so so the this motive but the thing is to make something fast in javascript you can be done but you have to be really really restrained like you can't just rely on the language being fast you have to um write something that's really perf you have to have a design that's really high performance which means doesn't do unnecessary crap like to make something fast 
to make computers to make software fast isn't just like putting a bigger engine in it it means putting it means taking things out like not doing unnecessary work it's losing weight not building muscles perfectly phrased yeah um so i was like there's i started looking at like what was the weight that we could lose and one day i noticed that scanning like so to like read through all the messages in the um log to save to like search for some particular piece of data because sometimes when you had to rebuild the indexes you had to scan through um, read all the messages in the log and then build up new data structures and stuff and if the log was uh, parsed as JSON, this took this could take like a couple of minutes. Um, but I realized that with grep, grep could do it in like under a second once it was like once that that once it was in the um, file system cache. And, and then even if it wasn't, it would only take like a few seconds. So I was like, hang on, that means that JSON parse is actually the bottleneck, like this massive amount of work that happens in json parse and first of all it has to look at every single byte and then secondly it parses the objects it passes the raw data into a um data structure allocating memory and then creating this data structure inside of v8 and then might inspect like one or two properties on that and then throws it away and that allocating whereas like if you use grep it just scans it through as raw bytes and it still looks at every byte but but it doesn't um need to um reallocate like create all these data structures and then garbage collect them and that sort of stuff so just using json was like a massive uh was a problem so it's like okay well what is what would be the right format to you to you what would what's what should the format be like and um that's when i started like exploring options i looked at these binary um there's very very there's quite a few binary formats Captain out there proto, proto buff etc yeah uh, but so given that we'd already built our application around J json we needed one that was specifically um you know json semantics so um basically of dictionaries what they call dictionaries in Python, so object like like key value objects, arrays, primitive types, it's schemaless. Um, and there's a bunch of those. There's like Cbor, there's message pack, um, those are the popular ones. Then there's a whole bunch of other um, um, there's a whole bunch of other options too. Um, like that are less known less well known than that. It's like a fun project creating a binary json equivalent um but mo nearly all of them had this problem i saw which is when it had a collection so an array the the array would be prefixed by the number of items in the array and then each item would be um written so to find a particular item you still have to parse each um each item in the array to figure out how long it is to jump to the next thing but instead if you do it slightly differently so if you have it length delimited where the each container object so an object or an array is prefixed with the total byte length of that object including its contents then if you see that there's a value which is a large object or an array or something like this, and you know that the, the the field you're looking for is not inside of it, you can just jump completely over it um, because you already know the length, so you know where it ends already. You just jump straight over it, and then this allows you to take the binary uh, encoding of an ob of an object and read fields out of it without parsing the whole thing. So you can just drill in and parse a single field instead of doing the whole object um instead of passing the whole object into memory so this is as so especially when it, you're 
building a database. With a database, you do a query, you might read thousands of records, but most of them, you'll just look at one thing and then discard them and, and, um, and not do anything with it. Or you might not discard it, but then, then send it out to the network. So <clears throat> you don't need to, um, like you don't really, like passing it into a JSON object and then you just then it's just immediately serializing it again. That's a big waste of time. Um, but if you can just read out a field directly without without turning it into a um, an enlivened um, V8 object, that's way faster. You've skipped heaps of things and created a lot less work for yourself. Nice. Um, and, <laughs> Quick interrupting question on yeah. the format. If I have a field which is an emoji or something like that, how are the field names properly encoded? I assume everything's kind of UTF-8 style, but uh, how do you kind of check for some of those things on, on disk? Um, the fields are... Um, so BIP uses um, variants for everything. So um, um, an object is, I think there's a tag that says it's an object, then there's a then there's a variant that's like the length of the, oh, sorry, the com combined, whatever. Um, then it has the length of the whole object. And then it's like a sequence of keys and values. And the key is, has a length on it. So when you, so you're going through an object and you're searching for a key, um, you know that it's, you're looking for the, uh, the key is mark. Um, so that's four letters long. So you know the key is four letters long. So if you look at a key and you just first you check the length. Um, if the length isn't four, you know that it's not the key you're looking for. So you just you can just skip it. Um, if it is four, then you look at the next four bytes and compare it to what you were looking for. So um, it doesn't actually matter if it's UTF-8 or not. Um, it's just bytes, and you just compare the the bytes. It's just bytes. And you know how long it is, so there isn't any. So you also this is the other good thing about having things encoded with a length delimited format rather than like quotes. So if you have quotes around something, then you have to escape characters that are. If there's a quote inside the string, you need to escape it, and that means that now the length, you know, now you've got this escape character, so now the length is longer, and you have to. Um, go through and undo the escaping. So that makes the um, yeah, format really slower. Trashes performance. And I think it's yeah. why JSON is so slow. Even ignoring the stupid um, Unicode uh, translation that they do. But yeah. in the case of in the binary format, you're still going to get you, you still have I get that it's length encoded, but you still have to have some sort of metadata up front and gets this what it is but if you have a get i guess if you have a guarantee i mean so so the metadata up front has to be the field name so that way i can look up the field in the beginning and yeah. then run so and that, use the link to that go does put the field names in the message and those in the record. have to be safe though so how how are you in in my serialization format which i don't use mm. production um uh, although I've been wanting to for a long time because I have the exact same problem with JSON. Uh, as a quick aside, just to confirm what you're saying for anybody listening, yeah. is the very beginning of Venn in 2014, I hated JSON because JSON doesn't really have cycles. It throws an error mm -hmm. and graphs let you have hypergraphs. Oh, right. Which so is a always, bit of a bummer for a graph database. Yeah, yeah. I've always, always hated JSON. However, I just assumed that its performance is okay until I stumbled across the same thing as you did, I think. I, I didn't find it until three or four years ago that that all my flame graphs were all JSON parse everywhere, even though mm -hmm. I was spending, you know, months, years, you know, optimizing every other part of the <laughs> of the code, thinking that JSON, right, is fast because the whole world uses it and it's it's maintained by the biggest companies. So well, never... probably, I mean, it is probably as as fast as it could be. 
it's just a terrible terrible spec sorry douglas um so i mean for what it is jason is is fine like it's not it's simple um it it doesn't have like for a read a human readable format it's it's um it's you know it's it's good but it's just like putting high performance data through it isn't high performance anymore yeah uh, I, I still i care about performance at the end of the day because you can't escape it so um how do you wind up managing so in my serialization format i basically if if I, I don't use quotation as the escape. I use something that's very obscure. But if they, but if somebody does use that, I think I use unit separator, ASCII unit separator. Um, yeah. But if they do use ASCII unit separator in their thing, what I just do is I prefix, I like I prepend prefix the beginning, and then that is treated as like, oh, there's there's seven of these items before we're back down to. So there, technically, there's no uh, end. There's no end to the. Um, so you have one escape at the start. It's not necessarily one. I basically have the count length of escapes. So then I know. Um, so then I just count. So then I basically in you know skip to the the delimiter and yeah. then I just count down until I get. Oh yeah. Um, however, to me, it sounds like you're you're, you're doing something else that's magical which is somehow at the beginning of your index we have the field which you have to make sure is is safe somehow uh, no the the field um i mean the field own it just has the total length and then inside of it it can have anything um any bytes are valid um it doesn't so I'm actually um, not very smart on binary <laughs> or, or typed arrays at all. But I, yeah. I do know that, right, there's in JavaScript land, at least there's a difference between, you know, an emoji byte length and a, like, UTF-8 byte length. Yes. So I assume there's, you, you're having to use some sort of standardized lookup, which I, I'm guessing, right, is like the emoji might be a combination of two um, sub uh, characters which in string length <clears throat> will look like it's one item but in byte length it looks like it's longer but yes. because there's all these different um typed array and and again i haven't really used them so i'm sure if i use them so, uh, so uh, um ut how utf8 works is um is good to know um it's a so utf8 gives you a multi multi byte encoding for um, you know, um, like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or whatever of um, possible string characters. So, <clears throat> so you know, ASCII, um, the text that we are most familiar with, especially as Anglophone speakers, English speakers, um, the regular letters on the on the keyboard typewriter. Um, Back in like uh, I think tele teletypes used it, so that was basically a typewriter attached to the phone line. Um, it would send a, a seven, uh, eight byte, a, a one byte message that had seven bits for the character, including some control characters, and then one bit of error correction. Um, that was fine, but then people wanted to sell computers to um, people that spoke other languages. And they're like, oh, hang on. They they use languages that written languages that use all kinds of different characters um, that aren't in ASCII. We're going to need to invent something. Um, and they invented well, some of them actually. The um, it was the um, same people who invented Unix um, invented UTF-8. Um, where so at the at the so it has it's valid for ASCII, but then it has uh, where some 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 of the first you look at the first byte and you can see oh this this character is more than one byte, and then I think in the first byte it tells you how many bytes there are going to be, um, and then so it's might be two it might be three it might be four. Um, 
and then so it means that not every character not every character is the same byte width some are bigger some are smaller um, and then i think there's some case with emoji where an emoji can actually be made from multiple utf8 characters so there's a thing called the zero width joiner um utf8 character so i thought this was an interesting thing i um learned once so there's the uh okay there's the david bowie emoji right um it's actually there's it's actually the man emoji plus joined to the microphone emoji if i recall correctly but it's rendered um as a little picture of the consensus is that it's rendered as david bowie um and the ziggy stardust thing with the like li lightning bolt in his face and stuff um but it's actually two it's actually three utf8 characters um and this is super interesting because it's like you know languages real languages have um a limited number of words but you can make like an infinite number of sentences by combining those words together in a structured way um so you can say anything you want and i was like well emoji only has 800 characters um like how do you create new meaning with that and actually with the zero width joiner it means you can actually so they encode the david bowie emoji as two other emojis joined together and this but this means that you can actually start anticipating future um combinations that might not be a single emoji yet but if you use a zero width joiner uh so if you use the zero width joiner it means that if your um system doesn't know how to draw david bowie it just renders it as the composite characters so it will give you the man and the microphone so you can start gluing things together and then in the future when that has an official um when that has been given an official meaning by the utf8 consortium it will be rendered before it's compatible with the um the composite thing that they choose later and when when it's rendered on your computer it'll look like a single character um but this but for things like that the string length will actually be um longer yeah that is super cool and fun yeah uh, such a great background to it and then that, and that's also how all the skin tone um and the national flags and the gender of the family families and all that kind of stuff that all uses that thing so nah, it's fun it's kind of it's kind of like a big it's quite complicated now um but if i but get anyway. a template string in javascript and do dot length on it it will give me the character length not the um not the byte length so how are you yeah. do you like do text encoder i mean i i'm gonna just peek at your code of course but for the sake of oh i mean how would you wind up coming up with the, making sure that you are calculating byte length correctly in javascript code such that it is uniform regardless of whether uh, utf8 characters in there utf16 sequence uh, arrives whether it's two utf8 uh, um, or it, anything else. It, the implementation just uses buffers and doesn't touch strings until it decodes until you've asked for the value of a particular field so when it's searching through the um object looking for keys it just uses buffer dot compare so it just compares the raw bytes and doesn't doesn't turn it into a string at all so i have a bunch of sorry stupid questions on this because i am trying to like understand that whole world a little bit better because yeah buffer doesn't exist in the browser so i never really used it i know um i i do have a polyfill for um the cryptography library which is uh, then converts to, like text encoding and stuff underneath but i get you know text encoder versus utf8 versus buffer versus um, array buffer versus uh, typed array all kind of yeah. confused in my head so in the browser if you're using buffer you're obviously oh, probably feeling um it, it um yeah it, i think even a nard 
buffer is now actually inside of it and is actually a typed array because but when they started node typed array wasn't in the browser yet okay and i think typed arrays can be of like three or four different types yeah um, but the the byte one the uh the int eight array is the one that gives you access to individual bytes and um that has a different api that can do all the same things that node buffer can do so assume we get some um text data from the browser which is you know text area dot value that's in javascript how do you first convert that into a buffer that you're then going to pass into um bitf or you know the typed arrays and buffer um Well, uh, I think to encode things, how it how it works is you just construct a JavaScript object, and then um, then there's an encode method that recalculates how to um, turn that into a, a binary object. And so the interesting thing is this is actually the slow part of BIP because 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 it uses the length. Um, delimiter first it has to figure out how long the an object will be and then write the length so it needs to first traverse the object and figure out how many bytes it's going to take to encode this then it writes the length then it encodes the thing so it takes twice as long it's going to handle everything twice to encode it but the insight was that um in a database you're decoding way 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 more than you're encoding Writes are relatively infrequent, but reads um, way way more. Um, there are way more reads, so um, way more reads than writes. And then if the and then if you're doing a write by just like reading from the database, then sending it to the network, you don't actually need to rewrite it. You're just taking immutable data and then sending it. So you just send the bytes. So. Um, you know, if you have valid UTF-8, it turns that into a buffer that's simple. Um, the, and the node buffer has a method for telling you what the byte length of a UTF-8 string is. And if you decode any buffer um, to UTF-8, there's like a way of, uh, in UTF-8, of encoding it as a string. Um, but where it's like the binary things are escaped, like you can do, I think it's like slash x zero zero gives you a null byte. So a, a JavaScript string can actually represent anything, uh, any byte string, but not not efficiently. Um, and the string, the lengths are different, but um, you can calculate the no buffer can tell you what the actual byte length of the string would be. Nice. So then when you save the data, obviously in Node you're just able to save it as the buffer directly hmm. in the browser Correct. though do you have you just said well okay that's kind of the problem with index db and, and local storage there that those systems are slow even when you do do you have a browser based implementation of, of writing those buffers to to disk uh yeah, yeah so in the in the browser um we actually didn't write specific browser code. Um, just write wrote file system um, co um, code, and then used the um, the polyfill that um, they created for Hyper. That gives you the same interface for like random access into files. Um, that's used as in in um, Hyper in Hypercore. Um, and that works in the browser and that works in node um so we just use that i'm guessing it just converts it back to utf8 puts it into the storage systems no no it, no it definitely uses um some... it definitely uses bytes no but you can you can uh on top of there's an uh, index db mutable file um object that's a bit obscure but gives you file access um and there's also a file system API in Chrome that 
is officially not on standards track but i have been informed by chrome developers that there are google apps that depend on it so it's not going to be removed <laughs> yeah um okay so you do kind of depend upon um the browser to have some of these edgier case um storage systems else it doesn't yes but i i i i i used the um a polyfill that dat had already written so um i i mercifully didn't have to deal with any of the details there that seems to work really well right okay all that's I, I know Matthias and them have split everything out into separate modules, yeah. but it's somewhere in Hypercore yeah. at itself, um, or is it off in like some hyper dash something? Uh, random access file is the name of the module. Sweet. Okay. Recording is on. All right, you cut out a little bit. The the that voice, module... that voice is so ridiculous. <laughs> I know, right? The the module name. Um, what was the oh, uh, um, random access file? Random access file. Okay, now coming back to now, uh, really compelling argument that a database is <laughs> sure you're gonna do a lot of you're gonna do a lot of writes, <laughs> but um, it's much faster to do the upfront work because then all the amount of synchronization to other devices, sending it around to different machines, even if you're writing it again. Um, that upfront work on the machine that created those bytes originally, uh, converting it from character length into typed um, array or buffer type length, and then sending it out. Now let's talk about that read side because that's finally you know the really compelling, exciting part of this. So you just get these buffers wherever they are mm -hmm. in the network. You don't have to. You can be streaming. No, no um, the so the. Um, the main problem wasn't getting them, getting messages over the network, but was just the local database. So, um, the messages are not actually transmitted as in this binary format, they're actually transmitted as JSON because that was, is backwards compatible with the network. Um, I mean, changing that is a to do um future to do thing but already a huge advantage has been reaped by just changing the uh, local database format so the read cycle is just looking at so let's say you 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 want to see a thread it's a discussion um it's got a bunch of messages from different people they're all on your hard drive already um and then other responses and likes and emoji and shit like that um you could look at your database file find from the entire database find just the messages that are about that thread um and to do that you look in the indexes that point back to those things so there's an index that is about that thread you grab that that tells you the messages then you can just um you know zap those out that's actually the easy part the difficult the part that was slow was building the indexes but that's now fast because even if you have to rebuild the entire database, uh, rebuild all of the indexes, reading through the all the records is really fast now because you don't um, do any JSON. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so, for that quick um, uh, note. But I, I'm guessing yeah. it's pretty easy to do the forward compatibility. Like I said, you know, three four years ago, I, I started my own serialization format. Yeah. Um, and I knew that I could basically just everything by default is JSON. Ugh, that was you know a regret from the very first day, but whatever. I was convinced by this stupid idea of. Anyways, um, it's pretty easy to just send like a header that then asks the other machine, "Hey, do you accept this new format, BIPIF or whatever it happens to be?" And then if yeah. maybe the first bytes of the wire JSON, but then it can dynamically switch over. Well, you know, they peers and this. Battle back case, the the main uh, problem is the um, um, format. Uh, every format, uh, uh, the every message is signed, and the sign signing depends on the JSON format. So 
you would need to to verify the messages you would need to convert it into json and then verify the signature and then um or otherwise you'd have to change to a new signature format i mean it's all it's all do it, that's totally doable um but right for old data the json's embedded ug yeah well, I, I it's, not, right. I it's embedded that. in the it's embedded in the signature so what um miniverse does is it receives a message as json and then it converts it to bib um you could i had planned to start new feeds that were signed in but in in this binary format but um so but basically the other thing about this is i um i had like figured this all out and figured out like this is what the new design how the design works and we should better get this like really good performance um um improvement but then i actually like burnt out and was like i i can't like i'm you know officially leaving the project i'm not um working on scuttlebutt anymore and then um andre and anders um were like they actually picked up picked up the ball and kept running and they so i i did the research work but they actually got it into production um which was probably the hard part um the post they wrote about how like emotionally grueling it was is like quite terrifying but they did it and it actually made the application itself like not the like the database the raw benchmarks of the database was 10 times faster but the application from like a user perspective is five is still five times faster um so the database was a considerable impact but there's still lots of things the application does but it that adds additional overhead but it made a huge difference um and, that's really amazing and awesome yeah. and exciting sorry for your burnout but also you know congrats in terms of that having the mantle being passed and yeah. the follow through on both the research and the follow through is that is incredible. Well, well, I think I think to any like open source project, um, you shouldn't really consider it a mature project until the original uh, the, until the person who started it has left um, for whatever reason. Um, but you know that the project is like a healthy thing when it's like maintained entirely by the community by a community that wasn't like just the first person who started it so you know. so true but yeah dang it i want to move on to <laughs> machine learning ai research and all this stuff but i can't because i don't have like an andre that steps in and and this stuff so you, i i agree with you but you also do kind of get trapped to some degree unless uh, yeah. somebody comes along. <laughs> I think uh, for a long time, I was like afraid to leave because I was like, will it continue without me? Um, but then I got to a point where I was like, I just like didn't have the motivation to continue anymore anyway. So I was like, just I'm out. But then I went to my like pleasant surprise. I was like, oh, it's so like, doing great. I'm so sorry. Um, about just the burnout factor it's yeah, yeah it's, it's really i mean it happens it, 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 it happens to um it's not it's not unusual yeah i i think people need to um change the the phrases of death and taxes to add burnout death taxes mm -hmm. and burnout because it's just like yeah if you just take it for granted that burnout's going to happen then i mean you just burn yourself out on burning yourself out <laughs> terrible advice all right um yeah. so now there's two issues right oh yeah i keep on forgetting about all of the signed data which is in a, a freaking stupid json format and right that even if over the network you could do the upgrade um anybody who is like oh well i have this new uh format serialization and they start doing that by default they're still going to have to create a fallback which means you're now doing two pieces of work rather than um, one for all the old people that haven't upgraded, even if they, um, yeah. So no, well, I think I think in this case, the with this kind of like immutable signed data, the only real option if you want to upgrade something like that is to create new feed formats that aren't supported in the old clients. Um, and i mean um as long as it doesn't crash them i mean it's like not there 
not the end of the world. Um, right. Just like with the UTF-8 emoji thing you're saying, that the old devices would just kind of see that there's something here and print a question, you know, the, the unknown character symbol. And you can kind of use that to up to have like the UI hint that, hey, you know, maybe you guys need to upgrade to a newer version for future facing data. Obviously, yeah. past facing data is going to work, but it is. Yeah. You know, so that yeah, way you have like all future data going through the old performance stuff. But yeah, uh, frequency yeah I think, it, you know, I think it's a big, I think backwards compatibility is like a big, a huge problem in that it keeps it causes us to continue to do stupid things. Um, so I mean, yeah. I wouldn't have started um, a project like Scuttlebutt if I didn't believe it was worthwhile just doing things completely differently and attempting to like, you know, throw away everything and just let, let's, let's like, what if we just started from scratch? What could we build? Yeah. I mean, so it's like that sort of thing isn't isn't like um um usually isn't financially viable in the short term so it helps if you um are like financially independent or live on a boat or something like that so you can just pursue things that interest you rather than uh paying your bills right and in general the fact that it took both of us long enough to like actually do the benchmarks against json versus assuming it's everything else our fault we made a lot of progress in that time um, a lot of stuff happened and mm. you wouldn't want to take that back or or have any regrets on that because had you started with like suddenly this let's create a virtual machine in byte level land so we can like not worry about json um you potentially could have led down a path of like oh two years on just that to, to, to begin. Mm. And then you're offset on the whole rest of the original project you wanted to start, which oftentimes is not the original project you want to start. You actually want to build the application, but you're having to build all the infrastructure for it, blah, 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 blah. So, but assume now there's some hmm, Dominic secret project in the future uh, or any project that you would start. Um, would you use BIPIF as is, or would you do something else, maybe a slight variation? And now let's then get into suite. We don't have to worry so much about this. We're just going to trust or assume that all peers starting in the, the network are going to be not running JSON. They're going to be running whatever this um, is. Yeah. Uh, good, good question. Cause so the, the, rough, the funny thing is I hadn't actually intended BIPIF to be the new format. I was just like, this is a proof of concept. And then I went away and came back and I was like, they were using it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. No, it wasn't like 100% finished, but you know, whatever. Um, not my problem now. Um, um, that was um, designed specifically to be JSON, same semantics as JSON. Um, if that's what you want, um, then it's fine, but it does create overhead from having all the string keys. However, if you can have, um, if scheme, if you can have schema data, so if you like know that we're only going to have these message types and this is what they look like, then um, you can get much better performance by not um, writing the keys. Um, so. So on this point, I think schema or schemaless um, is sort of a um, an emotional topic for some people. Well, meta question here is: Can't you, after you've done the binary format, can't you still pass it through? Um, uh, not zip. The what is the fast one in, in Java that has both JavaScript and is running over WebSocket. Is it, um, the compression format oh can't you just um that and you get that you get the the in the bip it the, the bips style with the keys listed it'll just compress those for you no yeah but that doesn't that's not gonna um so that's not gonna make access faster and so for the database question the 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 
um, compressing it means that now there's more data structures and more looking at every single byte. Um, it means you don't have to send as much data, but it makes access to that data. Um, you're trading space for CPU and memory. True. But isn't so, WebSockets and HTTP all doing the compression over the wire already in the first place? Um, yes. Um, if, it, if the headers say that it's bees up hmm okay well, but, maybe I'll, I'll skip past that or uh but, um, separately. so anyway anyway the, towards the, the approach so if, if you if if so one thing is i think network so type type um you know type checking and stuff has become um had a resurgence um um recently and but i think the thing is that like network programming like a network protocol is fundamentally dynamic anyway no matter what because you can't actually tell what software another computer is actually running like if you open a network socket to something it could send you anything and you need to um you know, if and if someone figures out that, oh, if you just encode the message in this this way, um, it'll get this behavior from this implementation. Then some sooner or later, someone will do that. They'll like abuse uh, any kind of edge case that they can find if it's useful to them. Um, you've got to protect from invalid data uh, or data that you consider invalid coming in. Um, so the way I see it is that network data that travels over network is fundamentally dynamic anyway um but if you have a sufficiently constraint like you have if you know what you want then um designing schema up front means that you can have um much more concise um data and so i'm working on a new encoding format that's um schemaful that's inspired by um captain proto um captain proto was a really interesting format um that you've probably heard of it was actually created by the um same guy who made Sand, sandstorm oh right yeah sandstorm so yes yeah, he then he went on to make sandstorm uh, but he used to work at google where he made protobuf um protobuf is so protobuf is as it sort of doesn't you don't you generally don't look at it so you just it has all these generated like outputs and like generated code to read it and write it but the format itself is like nearly it's actually quite um json ish like it's it's much closer to json than i thought um it's still binary but it has field doesn't have field names but it has field numbers so you can put all kinds of it's actually really dynamic and like it has type all the types that you write in the schema for this thing it actually um is actually a lot less typed than that so it encodes like a um integer but all of the integer types actually have the same representation on the wire so you you might write a byte but then the other person at the other end can read it as a um 32 bit integer um and the format itself doesn't actually care uh, about anything like that um so the the format itself only has like three types and <clears throat> some you know no maybe five or you know some small number um strings and buffers and embedded objects are all represented the same way um so most of the schema stuff is actually on the receiving end and then it has a few things like um like on and json you can have an object with multiple keys that are the same, multiple lines of the same key. Um, like you can use the same key twice. And what happens is actually the previous key just gets overwritten by the second key, but it doesn't throw an error. You can do the same in um, protobufs. 
um, Captain Proto is totally different. It's way more um, um, performance oriented and way more dependent on schemas. Um, and the 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 interest so so the so pr Captain Proto always sounded really good, but whenever I started reading about it, I just got more confused. Um, like there's a there's a thing they say that's like the second system problem. Um, it's described in the Mythical Man Month. It's like don't use the second system that an engineer used has designed a designer has made. Use either the first one or the third one because the second one they'll put in all of the ideas that they had while building the first one that they hadn't um, they didn't have time to implement and so the second one will be too complicated but then that will fail and then the third one will be simple again <laughs> and this might be the case with protobuf because it has so the basic idea is okay so all of the values are like a fixed width so numbers and integers and stuff like that they're always they don't use a variable and so they 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 take up more space because they always encoded with the same amount of bytes but the great thing about that means you know exactly where they will be you can just jump to where they will be and read that so once from the start of the record you just go to exactly the place that that, that value is always encoded you don't need to pass anything you just one operation you just read it um <clears throat> that's for primitives that's for numbers and integers and floats and booleans and stuff like that then for things like strings and embedded objects they can be variable sized they're encoded with a relative pointer so at the, in the fixed section there's a number that there's a pointer but the pointer just points it says like um seven bytes after after here there's a string uh, well there's something seven bytes after there and then you go there and there's the string so the fixed size stuff's all at the top and the variable size things is after that and then the reading a single record read it so reading a by uh, a primitive is just a single operation and reading a string is you read the pointer then you read the length then you have the string um and you can then just, that's still so, a one technically that's still a one because yes it's one. Yeah. yeah 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 whereas in bit you have to to find a string um you have to s skip past the keys so it's o it's o n um skip past the keys that you don't read um but in Jason, you have to look at every single byte. Well, it's also it's still um, on, but um, <clears throat> a bigger, a bigger n. Oh, and I guess if it's deeply nested, then the nesting um, causes you to go into loops and recursion and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, so hold up. If if the field name is at the beginning, so maybe you have to scan over the, the fields to find that initially. But then you're able to jump straight to where it's at so that jump yeah. is is a single operation um is it just you're saying that find matching the key at the metadata table head um or whatever you call there it? is no there is no metadata and um captain proto because it has the schema the metadata is in the schema right but sorry so reading a single feed a field is always on so you don't need a loop to read a, any particular field Okay, so you're saying in BIP, you, it's not the jumping that's the problem. It's just that at the very beginning, you have to check for those fields, and that may take some. Uh, that, that's yeah. Note. It starts. You need to read. Uh, you need to have a loop to find any particular field. Um, but you just saved all of the turning it into a, creating a new data structure and stuff like that. So you just do a lot less looping. But yeah. with Cap Captain Proto, um, you don't need to do, uh, you don't need a loop to read a field. Um, however, the problem with Captain Proto is like the more, it has all these other features like uh, segments and um, far, point far pointers and near pointers. And um, just, you know, sometimes 
sometimes you start learning about you hear about something and you're like well that sounds really neat and then you start learning a bit learning more about it you should ideally go from like oh it was kind of curious and then you're like the next stage is like oh now i understand that better and then it's like oh now i understand that better um so you're like you're like now you feel like you smooth transition from being curious and not knowing to like now knowing things but sometimes um you know you start learning about thing and then you're like okay i'll learn a bit more about that but sometimes you become more confused um so you go from curious to like actually now i feel like i know less than i knew uh, when i didn't know anything that's just um, usually because the model that the person um is using to explain the concept is you know the details is a broken model it's not you know one to one to yeah the idea and so if you just fix if you just rework your model of it that it should parent but you're right if you're learning about it you don't know so but it's like but it's like you know you you want to learn something and then suddenly you're given all these details that you weren't looking for that it's just a sign i think that thing is too complicated ah okay that's also a fair argument so yeah. would you wind up um dabbling in creating your own kind of variant or are you far enough into that kind of um, <laughs> rabbit hole well, you would use that to start? I, I, um, yeah, I couldn't um, find a nice off ramp to be able to understand, like, hang on, how does this actually work? Um, but the idea, the first part that I understood of using your relative pointers and the um, fixed width thing, I was like, that's actually really simple and elegant. Um, so I just started writing my own um, thing that was like just the simple part and not the complicated part. Um, Always and, in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think there's enough room um, in the world for um, more encoding formats. If you have, if you have something to, um, let me if you have a different, if you have a, a, if you have a different take, and there's tons of things like Seabor and message pack and that sort of stuff that are basically the same design. Um, Look at the lesson we learned with the JSON. So we don't want to commit that mistake again. And so anybody listening, even though we're talking about these different serialization formats, the reality is you should just go build your own. <laughs> we should encourage, yes, more diversity of um serialization formats even if some repeat the same structures because at the end of the day you don't want to build on top of something you think is as guaranteed as json <laughs> and then discover this terrible rabbit hole later <laughs> yeah 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 i think i think that it, it's just important to um you know you should do that while studying the other um options right okay so now um i think i think actually your statement of looping through the metadata in bips before you jump was actually going to answer one of my earlier questions about then okay we'll pretend we have everybody running on the system how do we do this read access control so i think that answered in terms of bips now you're switching over well you're 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 theorizing and playing around with a uh, fixed format. Um, but I'm guessing that's going to start moving too much towards uh, a project you don't want to announce yet. So is there anything kind of left in this discussion of parseless data structures and these you know, fixed width versus dynamic width versus the BIPs approach versus the Captain Proto that you would want to cover before we close out or switch to um I, I will probably want to keep it probably oh, yeah. an hour we're going for an hour and a half now yeah so i think it's a good place to close out but i don't i don't um, i don't know if I, I don't know what i'm not missing um do you feel like we've covered the exploration space of the main yeah. of i think i think that we have okay yeah because we've gone through the slower approaches, we have approached now the faster parcels approaches, and you've discussed the differences where once you got to this parcels approach, you go down to 
to for, uh, fork in the road in this maze, which is using that fixed or schema-based approach or going down the dynamic one. Oh, one thing I should add is that during my researches into binary protocols, I discovered that I looked at um, CouchDB and MongoDB and maybe something else and found that they all had internal um, custom encoding formats that did allow in-place reads rather than they didn't use JSON internally. They maybe presented JSON to users, but they had more, um, they had formats that were more efficiently efficient to, where you could decode individual fields without um, parsing the entire object. All right, that is the moral lesson for anyone listening mm -hmm. is if you start your own protocol. <laughs> well, <laughs> particularly for a database. Yeah. I you, think protocols can also benefit from in place reads. Yeah. But um you've learned from our mistakes and we've learned mm -hmm. from the mistakes of Hadoop and Mongo and all those other systems and it's a cycle of peeping people making these mistakes. What do you want to end out on, Dominic? Do you have a call to action that you want people to do or take? Uh, even if you're a voluntarist, right? Even if you don't even if people all have their own free will agency, but like if they're really excited by uh, stuff that you've talked about, where would you tell um, them? I out? think I'll just say, um, don't be afraid of bytes. And you'll soon learn to better look at raw binary output and be like, you're about to read the little indian format integers you'll just better see them and be like oh yeah that's a that's that one and that one and that one um you'll get used to it you'll get you'll get um you'll learn to love it you'll see the matrix in it yeah <laughs> exactly yeah great thank you so much dominic for coming on and going over time and taking the, the time to explore the depth of these different um algorithmic mazes mm -hmm. and tagging each kind of branch I, it's super fun to explore. It was a lot of, uh, it, it was um, great and fun to hear the earlier parts about also a boat so that you can span both the physical material world down to the algorithmic logical world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty impressive in terms of your skill, your talent, and the ability to communicate. So uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thank for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks yeah. for having me. Mm -hmm. Cheers.